May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each heart be holy and acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. We made our way through several doors this week, shook the hands of some teachers, introduced ourselves, gathered the appropriate forms, got the necessary information. You know the old back to school routine? Our oldest is starting high school this year. And there were a lot of people, I emphasize a lot of people at the Tascosa Freshman Orientation. You know, it's kind of like standing in line at Six Flags, except at the end of the line there wasn't a fun ride, it was just another line. <laughs> the pep rally, the fight song echoing off the gym floors, the smell of the library, the screech of shoes on the waxed hallway floors. You know, high school. Some of us have fond memories, some of us don't. Most of us probably have a mixture of both, right? I remember high school, I remember trying to find something. I think all of us on some level were doing that. I couldn't have told you what that was back then, but now I believe a, a word I could use for it, I think I was trying to find community, belonging, right? A sense of community. I mean, if there were other things I was looking for too, mainly hormone-driven things, but community was important, I think. Community might be a good word. We're in the second week of our series on the Beatitudes, a series intended to help us recenter before we jump back into a new season of fall acti activities and school events and commitments and work. And I think we'll discover how essential community truly is because these Beatitudes, these teachings of Jesus, they don't make any sense outside of community. They are to be lived inside a community to transform and enrich our lives together. Last week we looked at just the very first one, blessed are the poor in spirit. The poor in spirit. It reminds us we are, all of us, dependent upon the grace and the mercy and the love of God. It encourages us to be open and receptive. It's a calling for humility. So now let's look at the next three. There's an old tradition in the west of Ireland. It's not as prominent now, but you can still find it in more remote and rural regions. It's called keening. Keening. And the tradition was and continues to be Whenever there is a death of a loved one, a small group of women keen. They sing old songs of mourning and they wail in the old tongue on behalf of the members of the community. When Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, he's speaking to something like this, except much larger and much deeper. Not just those who mourn the loss of a loved one, but those who mourn the loss of our way in the world. For those who are keening for a world that's losing its center, a world that's losing its connection to the sacred, a world that seems to be losing a connection to God. Because life is hard. Life is hard, right? And, and it's confusing. And there is sorrow here. And there is real grief here and there is pain here. You know the people who really wig me out, the people I just don't really understand, are the people who are never depressed, they're never despondent, they're never anxious, they're never aggravated by anything, they're never concerned, right? I want to say, do you live in some kind of freaking candy land, man? Do you live in some kind of leave it to beaver rerun world? Are you going home to June and Ward every night? I mean, look around. Look around. You don't have to look very far. It is hard. It's hard here. 
Life is tough. There's a gifted songwriter uh, I really like named Jason Isbell. On his newest album, Weather Veins, there's this song called Save the World. And he wrote it in response to the school shooting in Uvalde. And at the heart of the song is the sorrow and the grief he and his wife are experiencing combined with what it feels like to be a parent sending their child to school. What that means now. You see, it's a keening song. He's mourning. And we need those. We need to mourn. And maybe we even need to weep. St. Ephraim, the fourth century monastic and theologian, wrote, until we have cried, we do not know God. Until we have cried, we do not know God, because in those moments, what's happening isn't only mourning. What's also happening is we are being filled with something, and what we are being filled with is compassion, a willingness to suffer with people, a willingness to suffer with the world. And when the compassion of God is brought into any community, we can trust over time, over time, because it takes time, but over time, something occurs, and that something is comfort. Come unto me, all you who are weary and burdened, Jesus said, and I will give you rest. Even old St. Paul in his letter to the Romans reminds them to be that kind of compassionate community when he writes, let your love be genuine, hold fast to what is good, rejoice with those who rejoice, and weep with those who weep. Because comfort, comfort follows compassion. Blessed are those who mourn, for you will be comforted. The next beatitude, it reminds me of my mom. When I was in third grade, I had to get glasses for the first time. The first day I wore those glasses to school, my mother was driving me that morning and asked, are you worried kids are going to make fun of you now that you wear glasses? And I said, oh no, I know they're going to make fun of me. I mean, this was the 80s, right? There were no laws or rules against bullying. We didn't have those in the 80s. There were no elementary playgrounds. There were just tiny little arenas where Darwinism was run free, right? <laughs> Survival of the fittest, the weak killed and eaten. So my mother told me in her sweetest Dallas, Texas, Southern Baptist voice, Jesus tells us to be meek, turn the other cheek, and to forgive. So honey, I want you to do just that. And I said, yes, ma'am. And I wasn't even out of the car fully, and this girl from my class yelled, four eyes, four eyes, and I watched my mother, the one who just told me about the love of Jesus, slide across the hood of our car like Dukes of Hazard style and get up in this little girl's face and read her the riot act. <laughs> Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. But I actually think that story gets at something that's misunderstood about this beatitude because meek does not mean be a doormat. It does not mean let other people diminish your dignity as one created in the image and the likeness of God. Meekness here, a closer translation or interpretation would be blessed are you who are gentled. You're gentled. It's about gentling the more destructive patterns and energies inside us that inevitably make their way outside of us. Qualities that hurt people, qualities that hurt ourselves, qualities that hurt our communities. Those whose lives are marked by meekness don't operate out of fear or this need to control. But how often do we operate out of those? Fear has a thousand and one manifestations, and they play out in sometimes small, subtle ways, and other times apparent and appalling ways. There's this morning prayer that's become very important to me. 
And it asks that God would direct my thinking so that it would be divorced from self-pity, self-will, fear, and dishonesty. I have to pray that prayer because I struggle with those things. I struggle with fear. I struggle with not making it all about me. I struggle with asserting myself over and over and over again. But the more I studied this specific beatitude, the more I saw the picture of someone who is able to do something. I saw the picture of someone who is able to be both courageous and gentle. Have you all ever seen someone be those things at the same time? At work, in church, in their family, courageous and gentle? See, Jesus is calling his disciples to that. A community filled with gentled people. Those people know they don't have to waste their lives on the need to possess, like the landowners of the day, right, who possessed through violence and oppression and exploitation. And those cats haven't gone away. No, the wisdom of the kingdom of God is that we subvert the whole system through courageous gentleness. That's what helps create and sustain Christ-centered communities. That's the inheritance of the earth. John Steinbeck said, a Texan outside of Texas is a foreigner. I feel that. And I have a theory that one reason that foreignness is experienced is because the further a Texan gets away from Texas, the further they are from good, greasy Mexican food. I have a memory, a visceral memory, of sitting alongside the Seine River in the shadow of Notre Dame Cathedral in the heart of Paris. I'm in this space and I'm thinking two things at the exact same time. I cannot believe I get to be here and, man, I could really go for some enchiladas. <laughs> Maybe you've felt something like that before too. But let me just say that is only a faint rumbling to the kind of hungering Jesus is referring to when he says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. You will be filled. See, it's important to understand this isn't a hungering for righteousness as good behavior or a nod to the righteousness of the Pharisees because that kind of dotting every I and crossing every T righteousness is not the righteousness that Jesus brought. It's the righteousness of the Hebrew imagination he brought. It's the righteousness of the prophets of old that he is reminding and calling us to where righteousness and justice are intertwined where righteousness and justice are innately connected. They're inseparable. Even the Psalms ring out that righteousness and justice are the foundations of God's throne. So when Jesus says those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, it's like he's saying you who long for justice like it's a fierce growl in your belly, down in your gut, you will be filled. And just look at something. Look how Jesus in one way embodied this, moving it from the figurative to the literal. Who did Jesus feed? Who did Jesus make space for at the table? In how many parables is there a feast being given or a party being thrown? And who gets invited? Everyone. Everyone. Richard Rohr sees something at work in this beatitude. For him, it bids a certain question. And that question is, what is it we truly desire? What is it we really desire? Is it this kind of justice that extends to all people that no matter who they are and, and, and what they're like, they, they know they belong? They know they have a place at the table? Do we desire that kind of righteousness in our lives and in the lives of those around us? Or are we being shaped by the culture of manufactured desire? 
the ones that we're bombarded with every day through media, advertisements, which all too often work to dismantle and divide our communities, most of the time without our even knowing or paying attention. But people bringing a hunger and a thirst for justice, see, that can transform us. That can transform our relationships. That kind of hungering and thirsting can transform a community. See, these Beatitudes, this teaching from Jesus, it's called forth a particular, and might I say a peculiar kind of people the past 2,000 years. A people whose lives are characterized by humility and compassion and gentleness and courage and justice. And there's some more that we get to learn about next week. But he didn't teach these things so our churches would be nicer and more attractive and fuller and that we could stand around on Sunday mornings and pat each other on the back for being noble, virtuous people. See, I think he taught these things so that we could be transformed and then become agents of transformation out there. Out there. Because we're not just members of a church community. All of us are members of multiple communities. So what would it look like for us to bring this wisdom from the heart of Christ to the heart of all the many different communities you and I and everyone in this space this morning get to touch? City, work, school, neighborhood, street, home, family, all the way out, all the way in. There's only one way to find out. Amen.